This event for the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee is tax taxing the Internet. How long should the moratorium last? This is about our fourth or fifth briefing on this issue in the 11-year history of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Um, and, you know, the issue kind of ebbs and flows, but uh, a, a lot of folks weren't around uh, back in 1997 when it was first introduced. Uh, Bartlett Cleveland, our moderator for today, was around at that time uh, when he was working for Senator Ashcroft. He'll be our moderator today. He's also on the, my board of directors. So what we try to do is put together our, our panels in a fair and balanced manner and, and, and try to make them um, equitable. So Bartlett will uh, do that job as a moderator. Um, Bartlett currently works for the Institute for Policy Innovation in Texas. He also does work for the Information Technology Association of America. And previous to that, he was with Americans for Tax Reform. Um, just one uh, bit of housekeeping. Uh, it's a pretty busy week for us. Tomorrow in the Senate side, um, we have an event called Internet-Based Pharmacies Protecting Children from the Sale of Controlled Substances Online. Um, if you're interested in that, that's the handout. The invitation is out, out there on the front in this little piece of paper. It's from 12 to 1. It'll be in the Dirksen Senate Office Building, room 226. Next week, next Wednesday, um, in the Rayburn Building, in B338 of the Rayburn Building, we're doing an event on uh, patents, uh, patent reform, and how it affects the internet and information communication technology space. So um, that's going to be a luncheon as well in the Rayburn Building, room B338. Also, my last bit of housekeeping is what we do typically for most of our events is we collect one pagers from uh, our, our advisory committee members, and we also reach out to folks who aren't on our advisory committee to the extent possible. So those are compiled uh, for your perusing. Each one pager should have contact information where you can follow up. Uh, with the writer and get more information if you need to. So uh, use that as a resource. Uh, but we'll, if, I, if I may introduce Bartlett Cleland um, to, to open us up. And thank you, Bartlett. Thank you. Yeah, I'm on the board, which means he's my boss. Thank you for coming today. Um, I want to get you ready. A lot of people probably think of a free lunch, kind of like they think of open source. You think you it's free. <laughs> Actually, you do owe us something. And that is you owe questions at the end of the uh, opening statements of the panelists. Uh, they're each going to give about a three to four minute opening statement. So from now, plus my comments, you'll have about 20 minutes to start thinking of your best questions. So it's not exactly free. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Uh, as Tim mentioned, this is actually a very old debate. Actually not as old as some, but older than most people probably think. Uh, the, the very first time I heard of this issue was, I think, 1996, it may have been 1997, when I was approached by um, any number of what we called then online service providers. Today, we, I guess, just call them communications folks. They deliver everything in the world to us. Um, the, the, the parties were different. Uh, we had uh, budding internet companies. We had uh, shopping mall owners who were participating on panels like this. So as you can see, just by the nature of the people on the panel, the debate has changed. What is interesting is that we went through two or three iterations. I've lost track at this point. Um, I've been involved on one side of this debate uh, from one angle or another all along, um, including introduction of original legislation, uh, and then with industry associations and with activist groups. Uh, and the people have changed to this extent. We're right back to where we started. We're back again with communications folks and the government folks. Uh, the one other little piece of history I'll highlight, because it, uh, it, just because it may get referenced and it, at least it's important, there are some Supreme Court cases that speak to this issue, at least two. Uh, and there was also a government commission in 19... Good grief, 1999 was that? <laughs> um, Advisory Commission on Electronic Commerce. I actually staffed that commission. I've forgotten what year we issued our report. Maybe it was 2000. Um, it, regardless, uh, that report is still available online in various places and may or may not be illuminating to some of the topics here. So with that, let me get to the more contemporary debate, introduce our four panelists. I'm going to introduce all four. Uh, if there's anything I miss out of your bios that you guys think is relevant, feel free to throw it out as, uh, as the conversation goes on. First, uh, and I'll just go in order here, uh, Broderick Johnson, who, as I just mentioned to him, I think of him as an AT&T guy. Um, he actually has a, a varied career that I was not aware of, and a fabulous career. He is now president of Brian Cave Strategies and serves as counsel for Brian Cave, the law firm, uh, from my hometown, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, from 2000 2006, he was a senior lobbyist at AT&T in Bell South, handling uh, a plethora of telecom issues. Again, I know him as a tax guy uh, over there. He spent uh, two and a half years doing various, I'll keep it short, two and a half years doing various legislative affairs operations, not only in the White House, but then on presidential campaigns. Uh, he is here representing the Don't Tax Our Web Coalition, which is a, um, and I think this is a compliment, a sprawling coalition of, of uh, 
people interested in one side of the debate. I was going to characterize it as corporate, but they're not all. <clears throat> Next to him is David Quam, who is four years with the NGA. Uh, we, we actually met each other at the business roundtable where uh, he was under assault as uh, just coming into the NGA and handled himself wonderfully um, for his side of the issue. Um, and so I have great confidence in his performance here. He also, I just found out, uh, was the predecessor uh, running the subcommittee on the Constitution uh, in this, on the Senate side Judiciary Committee, which is where my former boss took over after he left. Next to him is someone I almost respect, Brian Biron. Take that back. <laughs> Brian is a good friend for a long time, and I can basically skip his written history. Uh, he was a David Dreyer guy and was fabulous on the House side uh, and has been fabulous at eBay since then. And I think I captured the, the uh, stunning highlights of uh, his career. I think, actually, without reading this, are, do you actually run the, you run the D.C.-based operation, correct? Well, that's broadly speaking, yes. Yes, very good. I, the senior person there, but I'm not quite sure I run it. And uh, last, definitely not least, someone who I've, I've, I've run into before, but we just chatted today, Jeff Arnold, serves as Deputy Legislative Director of the National Association of Counties. He has over 26 years' experience in D.C. working on and with uh, Capitol Hill. He is uh, NACO, if I pronounce that correctly, NACO's Chief Lobbyist on Telecommunications and Technology Policy, and is responsible for NACO's policy development on all issues. Uh, he used to work in the Senate. Actually, I'm kind of loving this panel. There's just a bunch of Senate uh, people. Sorry, Brian. Um, <laughs> well, a, and anyway, we're on the House side here. So. That, that, well, that's true. That's true. That was the that was the gift. Uh, finally, I'm going to say that our goal, all of us uh, have definitely agreed that our goal is to be as educational and illuminating as possible. Um, if you have questions, again, please, and I'm serious, get ready to ask them because we really want to make sure that when you all walk out of here, you all are the experts in what's going on right now in this debate on Capitol Hill. With that, I'll just go down, if no one cares, I'll just go down the line here in order with opening statements. And so I'll start with Broderick. Thank you. Uh, can folks hear me? Do I need the microphone? <clears throat> all right, you can hear me. I'll just <clears throat> yell because I'm a Wolverine, so we know how to yell pretty loudly, actually. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, by the way. I've, when I, I first got engaged in this debate, I actually uh, had uh, more hair and uh, a darker mustache. So that shows you how long this issue has been around. And it really, uh, it would be good if uh, two years from now, or actually after November 2nd, we didn't have any more panels to discuss the length of time for the moratorium that we could make it permanent. And that's what we're here to debate. And I appreciate then the topic which is uh, how long should the moratorium last? That's refreshing because previously we have uh, debated and fought over whether or not there should be a moratorium at all. So it's an important, important message that we all share that there should be an extension of the moratorium. It's just a question of how long. Uh, you all should keep in mind, it's very important to understand and remind yourself that this is about internet access. And it is not about whether or not there should be taxes on online sales. This is about access to the Internet and whether or not that should be taxed. Just think about, here's a, a sort of a parallel that you should consider. Uh, what, what sense would it make as a matter of any tax policy, state, local, federal, if every time you went to a shopping mall or every time you went to a library you had to pay a tax or a fee just to enter so that you could engage in commerce or you could gain knowledge about something. And that's what we're really talking about here. Again, access, access. Um, it has been recognized, again, for many years now as a matter of national policy. This goes back to the Clinton years, which is when the first moratorium was enacted. This is a bipartisan issue, by the way. There's nothing partisan about this issue at all. There's nothing ideological about this issue at all. The only ideological issue is whether or not we should tax access. And I think that that's, again, I think that debate is over. It's just about how, how long this moratorium should be extended. But it's been recognized as a matter of national policy that we should not allow state and local governments to impose taxes on Internet access or to impose uh, multiple and discriminatory taxes on e-commerce. And we'll get into the subject of that a bit, I'm sure, as we have an exchange here. And why shouldn't we? Well, again, it's recognized as a matter of national policy that we want to spur the development of broadband, and we want to make sure that people are, are actually taking broadband, adopting broadband. And while we have had um, much success in seeing broadband get deployed all over the nation, there are many, um, many, many millions of Americans who 
do, have not adopted broadband, and there are many Americans in lower income and rural communities who have not adopted broadband. That's where the issue of cost is therefore so important. It's just we will talk about various studies, whether or not those studies are valid as to whether or not taxing Internet access has an impact on whether or not people will actually um, adopt, uh, ad adopt broadband. But it's, to me, it's a matter of common sense. If you make something more expensive by imposing more taxes on it, um, you are going to depress the ability of people to take it or interest in taking it. And we don't want to do that. We are not at the point where broadband should be seen as a luxury. It's a necessity. So how do we make sure the cost is low? Again, it's not a new, a new sort of new debate. People have been agreeing now since 1998 that we want to keep the costs low and therefore not allow state and governments to do the same, state and local governments, to do the same thing they have done with communications in general. Look at your, I don't know if you all actually look at your phone bills anymore, but, you know, for us old timers, we're used to this thick phone bill with all these pages that have all these taxes and all these fees imposed on them. And uh, for a lot of people, it's just a confusing maze. We don't want to do that with Internet access, and that's such an important part of this debate. So uh, let me go again to the point about how broadly the support, how broad the support is for not taxing Internet access. When this issue has come up in the House of Representatives, I know it happened in 2003, and I believe it happened in 2001. There was so much support, right? There was so much support for the moratorium that the bill passed under suspension and without being a recorded vote, and it was a permanent moratorium on Internet access that passed. When you look at the bill that's being considered this year, there are almost 100 co-sponsors on a bill that has Congresswoman Eshoo to Congressman Goodlatte as co-sponsors of the bill. And I think I've been talking for four minutes, so you want me to move on? We'll go on and we'll talk about this further. Thank you. There. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is David Quam. I'm with the National Governors Association. Um, I always uh, appreciate the, the opportunity to both debate this issue and debate Broderick in particular. We've done this a couple of times now. Um, we need to be clear about what we're talking about. And I also appreciate uh, the title here because the National Governors Association, to be clear, is calling for an extension of the moratorium. So this is not will we have it or will we not. It is literally about the time, but it's also about something else, and that is the definition. Exactly what is it that we're trying to extend, and does that need to be changed to make sure we got it right? When you look at the moratorium, we are using a 1998 definition to define the Internet. Now, anybody here who was on the Internet back in 1998, for the most of us, that was two things. It was dial-up, and it was probably AOL maybe a few other providers, but it was very limited. I don't think anybody would argue that the Internet today is robust. This is a strong and growing economy, sector of the industry, and unlike is sometimes portrayed, I will guarantee you I cannot find one governor who is against the Internet. There is no one, no governor, who's against economic development, broadband deployment, or against propelling the Internet and using all of the great things that it offers. But in 1998, when this idea came up, it was to spur a burgeoning industry. Let's help get it off the ground. And let's do it in a way that recognizes the fact that this is the federal government trampling on state and local government taxation. This is a Tenth Amendment issue. The right to, to put together your own tax systems. And at the end of the day, that, came, that was passed and it was made temporary in part to honor the fact that this is a federal government imposing a moratorium on the states and local governments. It's been extended. This time around, we have to get to the core issue, and that is what is the definition of Internet access and what does it say, what does it mean? The old definition was written very broadly because no one knew how to define it. It said Internet access is access, but then it also includes the ability to package other services with access, and the whole thing is subject to the moratorium. In the past, we haven't been able to change that troublesome definition, which frankly is just too broad. We have a much better sense of what the Internet is today. So the National Governors Association is calling on Congress to extend the moratorium, but do it in a way that does three things. Be clear, because definitions matter. 
it's time to get the definition of Internet access correct. Be flexible. A temporary solution is better than permanent confusion. If you make permanent a bad definition, all the risk is on state and local government. All the risk is on the funding of government, agency, of government agencies and government groups who, by law, actually have to balance budgets. So dollars out means those are dollars that have to be replaced. And then finally, do no harm. It was never intended to, the moratorium was never intended to reach out to states and take money away. As a matter of fact, it was a placeholder in 1998. Grandfather clause was put in place to preserve taxes that were already in place and said from this point forward, for two years, we're going to impose this moratorium. There is a different way besides just making permanent a bad bill and a bad definition. Senators Carper and Alexander have introduced legislation on the House side that, I'm sorry, on the Senate side that reflects several of these principles. Limit the definition, let's say what we mean, let's make it temporary, extend it for four years, and let's maintain the grandfather clauses, which is an important protection for state and local government. At the end of the day, this debate does not have to be, and by the way, I, I've always loved the names because the other side of this issue, I represent states, which means tax collectors. Okay, nobody likes tax collectors. I get it, neither do I. But we don't get the benefits of don't tax our web. You, you guys got the bumper sticker, we don't. However, this is not a bumper sticker issue. You don't have to be for the web or against it. As a matter of fact, a reasonable extension, you can be for state and local government and for the internet. You can do both at the same time. And that's the, the compromise that's the middle ground that we're trying to find. Thanks, David. Um, I'm glad to know that everyone here at the table is in favor of the internet because honestly that really is the first point that was actually on my little card here. I wanted to share four points on this. The first one being uh, that we at eBay think that the internet is actually a pretty good thing, that it's been working pretty well, um, that uh, based on that we would say it would be a mistake to change sort of any of the fundamental underpinnings of how the internet works, including the tax-free nature of, of access. We think that the Internet Tax Moratorium has been something that has helped propel the Internet to grow. We think that this is a positive. And so point number one is really if you're going to, if there's going to be a position in favor of the Internet, we actually think it's to, it's to maintain this tax-free nature and we would say because it's really very fundamental, the idea of giving people access to this powerful, empowering technology, we would say that, that having that access not be taxed by states and localities permanently would be a good thing. So first of all, the Internet's working. Let's keep the fundamentals going forward. Number two is, in particular, it's kind of ironic that we're debating this issue now because, you know, my friends here from the states and the counties have one tough fact, I think, from their perspective, which is that state and local tax revenues are at a record high. I mean, that's just a fact. Go to the Census Bureau, look up state taxes, and you'll see that um, the states have never had revenues of the level that they have today. So in particular, a debate about making sure that the states can tax more, I think, is kind of ironic at a time when state and local budgets have never been more healthy. Num number three is the fact that the Internet, unlike most, we think, technologies and services, really is, as I said, a fundamental empowering technology. It's really key to the 21st century economy to be able to have access to the Internet and all of the services that are available over the Internet. And in particular, all of the services we believe that will be available over the Internet in the future. And as we've all, as we've both said, the, I'm the third one here to say this is about Internet access taxes. It's not about taxes being applied in any way to various services over the Internet or products that one might purchase over the Internet, that, that those are governed by other legal regimes, and we can come back for another one of these about any of those legal regimes if you'd like to talk about that too. But the important thing is that the Internet really in the future is going to be key to advancements in the health field, advancements in distance education, advancements in telework. You know, many of the companies out in California these days are spending a lot of time talking about 
the environment and global warming and what can companies do to, to help deal with that issue. And honestly, the Internet, just as a core technology of allowing people to do things at a distance, really is key to addressing that. So we want to advance that. We don't want to slow that down. And then, and then lastly, in particular from the eBay perspective, we think that the Internet has been key to allowing individuals and small businesses be able to fully participate in the 21st century economy. That, that the, the, for the first time, honestly, small businesses, Main Street storefronts and little towns around America are for the first time able to compete with the Walmarts of the world, at least by having access to a global customer base. They don't have access to the kind of sourcing and transportation that a Walmart or a Best Buy does. But in terms of reaching customers anywhere in the world, they can actually do that. And so if you're a small business who sews fly fishing uh, lures up in northern New York, for the first time you can sell them to fly fishermen anywhere in the world. And that is the power of the Internet, and that is something that we think we don't want to make it more expensive for that person to do that. If anything, we'd want to hope that the prices would continue to go down in terms of access to the Internet because of all the economic and social and, honestly, free speech sort of spin-offs that we get from that. So thanks for your time. Boy, it's tough to be last on a panel like this. Uh, I want to bring out a few points. Again, I'm Jeff Arnold from the National Association of Counties, but I'm also here representing the League of Cities and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. They've empowered me to, to speak on their behalf. So it's really all the municipal governments out there kind of feel the same way. I want to make really clear that it's important for you to keep in mind that no one wants to tax Internet access. In that, prior to 1998, there were only nine states that had imposed any sort of tax on, on the Internet access. During the one-year lapse between the time that the, the first 98 Act and then finally the 2004 Act went through, no one imposed, not a state or local level, imposed any tax on Internet access. I have not talked to a municipal or county official in this country that has ever suggested that they want to tax Internet access. I'm sure there aren't too many governors out there who would like to go out and say we want to tax your net. So first of all, I think it's, it's a political reality that we're put in a very difficult position to uh, suggest that we want to go out there and tax the Internet. We certainly don't want to tax email. One of the great debate things we hear on the floor all the time, the local government wants to tax email or IM or all those sorts of things. That's nonsense. We have no interest in doing that whatsoever. First of all, it would be just a logistical nightmare. But beyond all that, it's just, it's just nonsense. So when you hear those sorts of debate art things, I think you need to just reject them out of hand. You know, we're really partners in this game. Uh, when it comes to governance in this country, uh, you have to keep in mind that the people I represent represent the same people you represent. And I think that's an important consideration. The House and Senate uh, sometimes forgets that uh, we actually are government, too, and we have to provide the services at the local level. All of you live in a city or a county, unless you're from Connecticut, and they don't have counties in the same way that uh, the rest of the country does. But the bottom line is that uh, you, all, you all live in some form of municipal government, and you have to keep in mind that we're providing those services. There are many tax limitation states around the country which has limited local government's ability to raise revenue and subsequently uh, the idea of the federal government stepping in and limiting our ability to choose what's right for our communities in terms of tax policy really separates the, the people who have to tax and the services that are out there delivered on a regular basis. Constituents still want services. There's only one way to pay for those. Um, it's really critical to note that, uh, and David did mention that the Internet of 2007 is simply not the Internet of 1998, and that definition that he referred to, I really would ask you to go back and actually look at it because it, you'll laugh. It's, it's so comical in the 2007 uh, era of what the Internet that was thought of back then that uh, you'll understand once you compare that to what uh, they put in uh, S-1453, which is the Carper Alexander bill, uh, I think you'll see quite a, quite a different thing. The way we access the Internet, I mean, I, I'll bet you there are a whole bunch of Blackberries in the room. How, how many people thought just three or four years ago that you'd have a browser uh, on your hip all the time? Probably not. So we don't know what's going to happen down the road, and we think that uh, a reasonably uh, extended moratorium where we can come back and visit, see where the technology is, makes a lot of sense. Uh, we've given up. You know, there are some white papers out there suggesting that we're, we're for no moratorium. That's simply not the case. I think we realize that uh, the Internet continues to grow, and we want it to, and we want that competition out there. It's important to keep that in mind, that, that we'd like to see more platforms out there having access to the Internet, because with the, the more competition brings prices down, and we're all for that. Well, thank you, guys. Now, I had promised to these guys, as you can tell from my background, I, I have an opinion. And um, I, I was going to be unbiased until both David and Jeff had taken a shot at that fabulous work we did in 1998, right in the definition of uh, Internet access. It was a good definition in 98. 
even my 26 year old brilliance hasn't held hasn't held for a decade. Or <laughs> if you'd known about the internet the way it is now, you'd be a rich man. <laughs> All righty, um, we're going to go into question time. I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of a break. I have several questions up here that the panel has actually submitted to me to ask back to various panelists. But if there are questions in the audience, I'll start there. If not, I'll get us all warmed up with a couple questions. But you all tell me if you have a question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, I have a question for the Governor's Yes. Um, could you please expand on how the Supreme Court is The, certainly Congress under the Commerce Clause has the power and has used the power uh, under the moratorium to impose a moratorium on states. So Congress has the power. The question really, though, from a Tenth Amendment standpoint is, at what point is enough enough? And we, we have this battle all the time from the governor's standpoint in the states, uh, states versus the federal government. Where exactly does the line end? For 200 plus years, Congress, when it came to state and local revenue systems, really towed the line and said, you know what, a core part of sovereignty for states has got to be the revenue systems, the ability to collect and pay for those public services that they provide. Only in recent years has that line started to become blurred. And the moratorium is one of those, one of those examples of Congress wanting to reach out and actually use state and local finances to cover a national, a national issue or address a national problem. It's our stance that really when it comes to revenue systems we have to draw the line and say you know what if you're going to cross that line and congress has the power to cross the line the tenth amendment in our federalism uh, federalist system says you better be precise you better know what the consequences are and you better do it in a way that really respects the states and part of our problem with the definition as it's currently written is that all the risk of an expanding scope and an expanding internet and all the excitement falls on state and local government. That was not the intent. And therefore, if you want to get back to the intent of our federal system, Congress needs to be precise and only interfere with revenue systems when it's absolutely necessary and better be very careful when it does it. So it's not necessarily a Supreme Court case, but it is the system we have today. Well, and Barley, if I could just say one thing that I think a concept that should be kept in mind is the, is the interstate commerce authority of Congress, you know, to regulate that. And the fact that we would look at the Internet as fundamentally sort of an, an, an interstate commerce type of, of uh, service. That, that and, and what you, the ability of Congress to regulate that, in particular be, be, because, you know, we've talked about Internet access, but, on, you know, the issue of discriminatory Internet taxes is, is, is part of this. And some folks wonder, like, what would those be? Well, the fact is that there are oftentimes local service providers or product makers who, would, who do not like competition in the form of sort of interstate distant competition. And an example might be if someone were to receive their news over the Internet as opposed to receiving a physical newspaper, that the folks who sort of locally print up the paper might very well n like to see a higher level of taxes on essentially the same kind of service coming over over the internet from 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 out of state certainly local and state government would be far more responsive to that local interest than they would be to the to the distant interest and that's where the the, the federal government's authority to regulate interstate commerce is, is is really key so part of this is is that the internet we believe is is sort of uniquely very much of an interstate commerce type of, of service. Uh, we've already blur blurred the line, though, and I think it's important to keep in mind. What we're talking about here is Internet access, not the goods and services that flow over that access. And I think that's a fundamentally important difference. No, no. I mean, it is also multiple and discriminatory. It's multiple and discriminatory taxes. We're most clearly not talking about, for example, sales taxes, no. sales tax collection burdens being imposed on remote sellers. But, but, but the moratorium does cover when there would be a different tax, let's say, for a download than there would be for a physical equivalent, that that, that would be covered by this moratorium. And that would be an example of, in particular, an, an interstate service competing with a locally provided product where you could have discriminatory taxation. That would be sort of the, on the local or state level sort of playing field 
really would be distorted in favor of the of the local and state provider, which from our perspective would be why it's the Congress who has the authority to regulate interstate commerce, including the interstate taxes. And let me throw in a, a moment of uh, prerogative here. Um, and correct me, guys, if I've gone wrong at all on this. I was actually going to ask that someone, I thought it was going to be a softball question, and it might still be. No one had spoken in their opening comments about the multiple and discriminatory prong of the Internet tax moratorium. There are two prongs, actually fairly straightforward. Obviously, we have definitional debates that, that get mm -hmm. occluded, but it's fairly straightforward. No multiple and discriminatory taxes, <laughs> no, internet ta no tax on Internet access. I was going to ask, do we all agree? since it wasn't addressed, that multiple discriminatory taxes, that's not really part of the, the ongoing debate. It really is access and definitions of access and those kind of things. Is that Since I've been doing this, we've never talked about those are going to continue with an extension of the moratorium, haven't been challenged or changed. Are you, are you for making those permanent? Not making any of it permanent. <laughs> <laughs> so it is part so, of the debate. So it, I mean, it's yeah, part of the yeah, debate. Yeah, right. I just wanted to make clear, because it does get a little confused, I just want to make sure everyone's on board, because I think you were all saying the same the same thing, and that's just what I wanted to clarify for the, the crowd. Two prongs. It sounds like no one is contending that we somehow should be saying there should be discriminatory taxation. We're really focused on the other prong on Internet access. I just wanted to make sure. And, that, and that's what Brian was addressing more eloquently than I have. Well, we and, seem to have the states and, and counties saying that they don't want to tax Internet access. We haven't heard them say that they don't want to tax in a discriminatory way. Any, You're any, putting words in our mouth. Well, no, I'm saying you haven't said it yet. We'd love, I'd love you to say it, that, that you don't want to tax, for example, uh, iTunes downloads different than you would tax the, the same equivalent product provided locally. The problem with that sort of discussion, however, is that it's virtually impossible. To, I mean, it's a hypothetical without reality. Uh, the, I mean, how would you do that? I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's ludicrous. So we have to keep in mind, I can sit here, you know, I'm a former Senate staffer. I can come up with all sorts of weird stuff, uh, <laughs> hypotheticals. <laughs> Did it all the time. Uh, the reality is, is we have to focus on what's real, what, what, how the set taxing process works. Bottom line is, there's no way that a local government's going to do discriminatory taxes on um, Internet access. It's just simply not going to happen. Well, then why not make that permanent? We don't need to make it permanent right now. We need to figure out where the Internet's headed. No, yeah. no, no. The multiple and discriminatory taxes. Oh, the multiple, I'm sorry. The multiple discriminatory taxes. I don't think you need to make any of it permanent at this point. I, I, know, I know you said that, but why not? Not is necessary. There, is there something confusing about multiple and discriminatory taxes? Do you no, think that's just, not clear? it's just not necessary at this point. There isn't, there isn't, it that's, isn't happening. That's a perfect non sequitur. Which is also a good place to go back to another question. Back here, you had one. And well, folks, I need to I need to uh, restate the question so we get it on tape. So, uh, if I go wrong on anybody's questions, make sure to correct me. I think if I summarize your question, it is: shouldn't we be putting equal or more focus on finding ways to make sure that everyone has a PC, of which then to no 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 uh, challenge against Apple there, but a PC so they can get on the internet, and the internet tax debate doesn't seem to be quite as important as maybe providing that kind of hardware for people. All right. Well, I think it's still, that's a good question. I think it still is important, though, if everyone had a, had a PC, how much would the access cost them? If we were talking about free access to the Internet for everyone, then I'm sure my friends from state and local governments would disagree with that. So the two go hand in hand, but just because you have a PC doesn't mean you're going to take, um, you know, you're going to uh, buy broadband or high-speed Internet access. I think if you guys want to provide access for free, there's a bunch of people who be happy with that. Yeah, we'd love it. <laughs> I but, I mean, your, your, your question's a good one, and this goes to the broadband issue. Like, w with this issue, it's, it's really complex. It sounds simple on its, on its face, but everybody throws around, you know, oh, this is about, this is about broadband penetration. And, and Broderick tried to deflect the fact that there's both a GAO study and a University of Tennessee study that looked at those grandfather states who still tax versus everyone else and found that, you know what, there's no statistical link between taxing access 
and broadband penetration. If you really look at it, you're absolutely right. It's more about do you have a computer versus what a, is there a tax on the Internet when it comes to broadband penetration. We've got to get down to what's really important and what's at issue. And one of the reasons that, we, that the NGA has come out and said let's be specific and take these key points is let's get through all the fluffery, the oh, you're going to kill the net or oh, you're going to kill broadband, because again, every governor's for all that. But let's solve the problem at hand. Let's update the 1998 definition. Um, the problem is that even discriminatory taxation, no, no state and local government group has ever said those are problems or stop or discontinue them. Let's carry them through. But it's all part of, all part of one bill. And right now we've got to address, I've, I'm actually very happy that everybody here has said this has got to be about access. And at the end of the day, that's exactly what we have to do. Let's define access and let's make it clear as to what that means. I think that's, that's really the purpose and really where we should be heading. There's a, right over here. Okay, so two questions. First one, real easy, because I think I know all your answers. How long should the moratorium be extended? Uh, and secondly, how should the definitions be changed? If I might start, first of all, we, we have uh, essentially endorsed the Carper Alexander bill, which is a four year extension of the moratorium to answer that question. And I think that's all of the cities and, and counties fall in that category. And uh, what we're trying to do with the, the definition clearly is that uh, what we had was a, a shotgun approach. We had a bunch of pellets out there, and what we tried try to do in those definitions were pull out individual exceptions. What we're trying to do is trying to narrow that down to what really Internet access is so that we're more of a rifle shot and that we don't have to have exceptions out there to try to get at the various different types of technologies. We want to make sure that we understand exactly what Internet access is. Uh, eBay supports a permanent extension, and um, we believe that actually on the definition of access, I mean, if there are tweaks to the definition that need to be made, there's no effort, I don't think, by anybody in the, in the coalition, the Don't Tax Our Web Coalition, who wants to in any way try to go beyond the current situation where it is, where it covers access. You, there have been discussions about entities trying to bundle video or bundle phone services into Internet access and gain some kind of tax advantage. I don't think there's any actual concrete examples of anybody trying to do that. That certainly is not, I don't think the intent of our coalition is not to do that. So, you know, the, the question of having a good definition, I mean, I think there would actually be progress if we all agreed to make a good definition of access and then make it permanent. I mean, that's, that's, that's the goal of our coalition as, you know, as, as, as well, so. If, the, um, NGA is also supportive of the Carper Alexander bill. It's four years. Um, for all, all of you here, look, let's be staff insiders. If you're going to extend a moratorium and do it on a temporary basis, better to do it in an off election year. So even years, if you think through it, will probably make a lot more sense. And that's not me saying that. That's, that's what we, we've heard from others and makes a lot of sense. So the four years four year seems like a reasonable time period to move forward. Temporary is an important safeguard on this bill. It always has been. Um, it was a part of the balance uh, out of respect for state and local government. However, until you know what it is that you're talking about, temporary is also a safeguard against abuse, both on the state and local side and on the business side. It keeps everybody honest. I'm, again, heartened to hear that we should address the definition. And the, the issue with the definition back in 1998, the definition made perfect sense. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> For all of you who've had to draft a bill or legal counsel here, when you have to define something that you don't know how to define, what do you do? You define everything and then you accept things out. And that's how you try to get down to this world that you're trying to define that's never existed before. Fair enough. A technique that makes a lot of sense in 1998. All we're saying is we now have to reverse that. We have a much better sense. We all have agreement that it's access. So let's define access. Um, and that way you don't risk putting a lot of other things into that grand definition that no one ever anticipated. Um, and at the end of the day, what we want to make sure of is just because something is provided over the Internet doesn't mean that that determines its taxability. Access is the, 
is subject to the moratorium. Everything else is subject to state, and state local, and federal tax law, just like it always has been. Uh, I may be the only person on this panel who actually worked in, in the Legislative Council's office. I, I drafted legislation for six years, and, and I w wrote a lot of the Family Medical Leave Act and the 1990, 1986 immigration law. So I, I have a lot of experience with definitions that people will argue and litigate over whether or not they are clear or unclear. But this notion that we have to make this law temporary because the definition of Internet access is unclear is that flies in the face of every piece of legislation that's written up here. Why should we not make every piece of legislation up here sunset? Why, may, why not make every complicated law only temporary? Seems to me, I don't think you can point to any situation in which any of the companies or associations that are part of our coalition have been abusing the law since 90, 1998 to look for ways to not uh, to, n to not pay taxes or not collect taxes. I know of no situation. I don't think you all could refer to one. So it seems to me the burden should be on on your um, states and your counties to demonstrate that we have been seeking to abuse the law. In fact, the opposite has happened. State and local governments, contrary to what you said, Jeff, have been looking for ways to tax internet access without question. When T-Mobile buys Internet access from a, a backbone company like AT&T, right, some state and local jurisdictions have been taxing that transaction, even though it seems abundantly clear that Congress did not want any taxes to be imposed on any Internet access at all, whether it's a wholesale transport transaction like that or retail. So we have not been the ones, and we're seeking a permanent we're seeking a permanent moratorium. We're the ones who've had to deal with a lot of abuse from state and local governments. First of all, abuse is an interesting term. Um, I feel abused sometimes with the simplest things when I drive in in the morning. The, the reality is is that we really, Broderick really gets to an important point, and that's what, what is Internet access, and what, to what level in the chain does, that go, does Internet access go back? Do you, are you not allowed to do anything with the, with the backbone itself? Does this moratorium go work all the way its back to the head ends? Uh, it's an important question, and that's why the definition really needs to be crystal clear, because otherwise we could have debates about this all day long as to what is or isn't subject to taxation. And I, I don't think Congress was as clear as they thought they were being uh, back in 1998. And I think what we really need to do is get back to what David suggested, which is let's get the right definition, then we won't have any of those discussions of what might be taxed or not taxable at state and local level or anywhere else. Next question. All right, so the question is specifically about the grandfather clauses, uh, clause, uh, whether it should be kept in or out going forward, I guess, under your various biases. So changing definition, but as a temporary or as a permanent, how it might affect. Well, certainly uh, the position of our coalition is that the grandfathers should end, that uh, state and local governments that were grandfathered um, have had ample opportunity to, to get used to a uh, permanent moratorium to adjust their, re their revenue expectations. And we shouldn't, certainly shouldn't have an unequal situation that we have now where in some states they tax Internet access and other states they don't. I always enjoy it when um, folks or some in industry decide that it is up to them to decide how state and local officials should spend their money. Um, the grandfathers was an important safeguard. It was a placeholder. It was, if you've taxed it up to now, you can continue to tax it, because that's fair, the do no harm principle. But from here forward, we're going to say no. As a temporary moratorium, that's an important balancing act that should be maintained. We're talking about 120 to $150 million for those states currently collecting. Doesn't sound like much up here on Capitol Hill. That's a rounding error. But in state and local government, that's a big deal. That's a lot of money. I think the, uh, a lot of folks in those states would care very much for the revenue that's there. However, there's also a second point. Again, and this goes back to the way this whole bill was constructed. The grandfather clause also grandfathered all taxes to that point. Now, everybody thinks it's just tax on access, but all taxes, direct and indirect. And part of modernizing this definition, and as we've come forward, 
part of the discussion has been what exactly is a tax on Internet access? Is uh, a business tax on an ISP, is that a tax on Internet access? It's a tax on the, on the ISP. Or should ISPs just be completely tax free? You have to get all those things right under a permanent moratorium. You have to know exactly what taxes are subject and what taxes aren't. And I think it's as important to business as it is to states because business would argue that states will get really creative and they'll, they'll find a new fee or a new way around it if we lock this in. States would say, wait a minute, are you telling us that you're making an entire tax-free zone for anyone who's on the Internet? Because that's not what we meant. And so the preservation of the grandfather is actually important for those two reasons. First, to those states who already collect, do no harm. But second, in addressing this legal issue of exactly what taxes do apply. And both of those would have to be answered before you can really do anything with, the inter um, with regard to these taxes. One, one more quick point, and that is I, I also always enjoy the argument that um, state and local governments rolling in money and therefore, we can pass tax moratoriums and, and the federal government should decide how to spend that. Governors have to submit and pass balanced budgets. Dollars in, dollars out. That is a real restriction on state and local government. This is not a for-profit entity that governors are running here. And so just because states are doing well now, they don't always do well. Taxes, as a matter of fact, revenues are flattening out. But at the end of the day, who should make decisions about state and local tax revenues? State and local officials or federal officials? And that again, surprise, surprise, Governor's Association says that should remain with state and local officials. Just in the context of having David say that nobody really wants to tax Internet access and nobody wants to have any discriminatory taxes, but then a very eloquent defense of states that tax Internet access, so clearly somebody wants to, and also the fact that he's concerned that there may be other taxes where they would want to apply to, to different maybe Internet-delivered services. I think in that context, our view is that the grandfathers ought to be ended as this is made permanent, that uh, the reason why it is very relevant, I think, for Congress to look at the revenue situation in the states in the context of this issue is because at, in a year going from 2005 to 2006 when state revenues increased, again, these aren't our numbers, this is the Census Bureau who collects this stuff, uh, state revenues increased $59 billion. So that was growth in revenue from $647 billion to $706 billion. So $59 billion increase, you mentioned that this internet the grandfather clauses states, those nine states, that their total revenue from these Internet uh, taxes were $115 million. Our view would be that um, now would actually be the absolute right time as state uh, revenues are increasing last year over 9 percent, that, that addressing this anomaly related to Internet access taxes would, would be the right time to do it because it really is a rounding error, not just a rounding error, in the size of congressional budgets, but more relevantly, this is a rounding error in terms of state tax revenues. And um, you know, if one supports tax-free internet access, and at least I thought five minutes ago that we all agreed that that was a good thing, then um, then now would be the right time to end the uh, end the grandfather clause that allows that disparity. Just don't love throwing numbers around. When you start talking about, you have to look at those individual nine states, see what situation they are, see what other opportunities they have for replacement taxes. So it's not just the the, the high big number, whether it's uh, you know whatever the, the numbers are there. Uh, it, that's not really relevant to you. Go back. You have to look at those nine states, see what their revenue situation is, see what the state allows them to to come up with other revenues. And I think that's a more relevant. Do, you, do, you, do either of you know of any state that's a grandfather state that had lower revenue in 2006 than 2005? I wasn't talking about lower revenue. I'm talking about replacement taxes. If but you got do, you, do you know of anyone with lower revenue? Is any, is any state that's a grandfather state actually have lower revenue? than the, So their, their revenue base is growing tremendously because the economy is doing well in part because of the strength of the Internet. But, um, but if, if none of them are losing revenue, I mean, that's, that's, I think, a relevant, uh, a, you know, a relevant point. It's not your money to spend. It's not your money to determine. And I don't think all the states are doing that well. We actually have some states whose revenues actually but do. But do you know of any of the down. grandfather states that have falling revenue? I'd have to check. I don't know. 
let me throw out one topic for you guys to address real quickly before I take on the questions because I don't, I don't want to miss it and a lot of you raised it in your questions and that is just on bundling. Could you guys just address that topic a little bit, kind of what, what the issue is? You, a couple of you mentioned it in your opening comments and then what the resolution of that should be and uh, we can work backwards. Jeff, you want to go first this time? Uh, we're, you know, the proposal we have on bundling, I think we worked out a fairly decent uh, compromise. Actually, let me back up. Would, would you be so kind as to give about a 15 second, I realize oh, okay. I use buzz terms. Yeah, that's could, right. Would you explain bundling, it? The idea is of providing uh, internet access, uh, phone, cable, all in, as you, you've probably all seen the ads on TV of everyone doing that now. That's kind of the thing. So the idea being is that if there are taxes, you would not tax, let's use the, the Comcast example just because it's running all over the place, uh, you know, for 33, 33, 33 for your phone, your cable, and your um, internet access. $66 of that could be taxed. The $33 that are internet access would not be taxed. The idea being that, um, that that way we'd be actually getting at that. The bundling language basically says, and it's it, it, if you do that, it's a responsibility of the company to to separate those out so that it's clear which is phone, which is cable, which is, or video, I should say and what is internet access. If for some reason the company is unable to do that, the entire amount would be subject to whatever taxes were imposed. And that was, a, again, a, I think a compromise that we worked out, uh, it's worked out pretty well. Brian? Yeah, we think it's worked out well. I mean, as Broderick mentioned, we don't believe there are any examples where, where companies have tried to sort of abuse that accounting principle that was created to try to avoid anybody trying to call something access that, that was not access. But we don't think it's been a problem. The, the, uh, the bundling provision was uh, an excellent ad. The issue, however, is you have to have a definition that allows you to actually separate them. If the definition allows you to put everything under Internet access and then you have to unbundle Internet access from everything else, it's meaningless. So again, we get back to the definition. You have to get that right. Um, because it's been temporary, I'd argue that that's really one of the reasons that this hasn't been abused. Um, because if you have a permanent bill, it makes a lot more sense to take the legal eagles out and see what you can shove through to get a tax advantage. But under a temporary, that really keeps everything much more honest. And if it's not a problem, then we should be able to we can change the definition and we won't have this issue next time around. And if we get the definition of Internet access right, you all will agree to a permanent moratorium. No, you never will. I mean, we'll never get the definition right as far as you all are concerned. When you file your taxes. We haven't got it right yet. Well, I think it's actually worked uh, better than you would have expected, right? Well, uh, the, the, it worked pretty well. But, but I want to go to, I want to come oh, back. Come on. I want to come back to common sense <laughs> again. When you file your tax return as an individual, if you take liberty to violate federal tax laws and regulations by issuing, by, uh, by filing a report, you know, that's shady here or, or um, or it goes to great lengths there to try to abuse the tax code or find loopholes, you're exposed. Same thing with our companies, right? So we have great exposure if we were to um, uh, abuse the, any loopholes we perceive in current law. And we just don't have a, an incentive to do that, so. Ma'am? Okay, um, I want to try to your question, Justice. Uh, to address the question of one, has there been any, is there any proof of less uptake because of taxing internet access? And secondly, is there any, is there any economic argument for why internet uh, should be exempt from, uh, internet access should be exempt from taxes when, say, phone or cable, I guess, or any other communications device might be taxed? Well, I guess, um, I mean, uh, they'll, They'll point to the GAO study and uh, the University of Tennessee study as proof for the notion that it doesn't matter that there are any whether or not there are any taxes on internet access as to adoption rate. So you'll you'll hear that. I guess I'd just say to that when you look at statistics though that show that for people who earn less than thirty thousand dollars a year, their adoption of internet access or or, or uh, high speed internet access or DSL or anything else is 
is substantially lower than people who make more than $30,000 a year. That seems to be a pretty compelling common sense uh, argument. Sure. So the question well, about elasticity uh, take up rate versus tax. I mean, you can say that they have lower take up rate. Yeah. Because it's because of price. It's because of cost. There's no question that, and the, going back to the earlier question, it, it, does, does the cost of computers impact Internet access? Almost certainly yes. I mean, cost, I think, is a general rule. I think we would think that, especially at eBay, where it's really a very a, market-based kind of system, is that higher prices lead to, lead to lower demand, for in general, for, for everything. And so since taxes would potentially become something that would drive the price up of the Internet access, we would believe that without question, just sort of as a general free market economic rule, that you would have less demand if you had higher prices. And in the telecommunications space, you actually have some very, very high marginal tax rates. You have taxes in the range of 25 percent of some different kinds of telecommunication service. The reason why we believe Internet access was made tax-free was because at the time that the Internet was just beginning, a number of folks up here, honestly, in the Congress said, you know, this looks like it's extraordinarily promising fundamental technology for economic growth. Do we want to allow potentially bad legacy tax regimes that apply to things like phones or cell phones be l l lopped over onto the Internet and therefore slow the adoption of the Internet based on, on high taxes. Because of the fact that Congress has acted over a couple different times to say no, we think that's one of the reasons why the Internet has grown well. And we think that the overall economy has been well served. We would say turning that back and now potentially moving in the direction of high legacy tax rates and applying that to the Internet would, simply by driving up prices, make it a slower evolution. We think that at a time when, when the Internet is doing so much good for the economy, that to make it more expensive to access it would be a negative thing. David, Jeff? Well, uh, first of all, um, I love the buzzwords, high legacy tax rates. High is a relative term, and I think it, you go back and look at it, it does vary dramatically around the country, and there are some that um, arguably could be said are probably too high. But the, the reality is, is that it's not our goal to take those legacy tax rates and throw them over onto the Internet. It's just not, not something we're planning on doing, and it's not something that I have any local governments ever said they would. All right, questions? Right here, I know you had your hand up for a while. I'm not suggesting so, so a, re okay. quickly, a related question to the one before, uh, tangential. What, what does the an increase in price or an increase in taxes, I guess, what does that do vis-a-vis -vis our standing and take up rate for broadband, especially with a global view? I certainly understand where you're coming from. However, I would note that we're 15th during the era of the moratorium. So I would say that there's no relevance at all when uh, it gets right down to it. Um, no, that, in, in fact, it, it sort of proves the point. We have a long way to go. Don't disagree. Okay. Yes, sir. Their internet access when they're 
Okay, so it's another elasticity question well, I, stated from the opposite direction. But I guess that's sort of then to maintain the taxes uh, don't matter if it's a product that's relatively cheap. I mean, that's what, uh, isn't that sort of where you're going with that, is it really doesn't make any difference? Yeah, no, but everyone can't do that. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, okay, well, there are a lot of people who can't just sort of go. And, and besides that, there are folks who want to be on the Internet at, at any given point. Are they going to have to, if they decide they don't want to adopt it in their own homes, that they then load up the car and go over and, and get, and, 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 no, but if, it if varies. You're, you know, if you're a small business person and let's say you want to have, because you want to operate in part over the Internet for your small business, then having sort of $5 dial-up or, 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 or having really the basic um, AT&T DSL, which I think is at that rate for two years because of the Bell South it's merger. Not it's, not a, it's not a secret, but it's also not something that they're <laughs> planning to do for long. Um, that uh, that the you know the fact is to to have a more robust internet connection. And again, we look at the future five years from now. Maybe a small business person who's trying to sell things over the internet would want to have video to sort of show their products and things. You know, that could be a seventy, eighty dollar internet access bill at at higher speeds. And uh, you know, again, I understand that our friends from the states and localities say they really don't want to tax this thing, but they really just want to retain the ability to tax it if they really want to. Okay, and there are other kinds of telecommunication services where the rates do run up in the 25% range that, you know, taking Internet access from $80 to $100, that would be a meaningful tax increase. And, and again, we would look at it from the other side and say that we should be weighing the many benefits to the economy, to society, to, to sort of public discourse to have more access to the Internet, and that we wouldn't want to raise – the, the, the cost of that even a dollar with the tax revenue, that the tax revenue benefits are not nearly as beneficial as greater access to this new technology, this very powerful, empowering technology. You know, that's one of those things, I, I like that argument, except the fact that well, how do we play for police, fire, you know, schools, seven hundred and six billion dollars, ten percent revenue increase last year. As you said, me, at the, the local government the, the level, the tax right, revenue right. is just marginal. At the local government level, we may not be as robust. And I'll just tell you, it's it's a really a tough road to hoe. For every nickel that uh, we bring in tax, goes right directly back out to the citizens of this country. You got to keep that in mind. Can I make the point though? These are among the most regressive taxes and fees. And when the city of Baltimore, for example, wanted to balance its budget a couple years ago, it, it added a three dollar or three dollar and fifty cent tax to every cell phone and it didn't matter how much the income of the people of course was that they taxed and that was an easy way to collect revenue and they did it and it just seems to me it wasn't fair even though I'm a product of that city it's it's always nice to be able to <clears throat> say I don't like a tax um, it's regressive um, sales taxes are regressive there's a lot of regressive taxes if you don't like them go out and when the facts aren't on your side and I think the questions the economic questions were actually right on point because you got to ask what are we trying to do here and are we doing it and when you don't have the facts you come back you know the old the old adage argue the facts if you have the facts and if you don't pound on the table you get the pounding on the table um, the regressive it's a tax they have they have the money to afford this um, well, hopefully we have the money, you know, governors have the money to also help with, with health care and schools and a lot of other things. But at the end of the day, again, whose authority and whose revenues are these? And ultimately, this is a state and local tax issue. And those decisions should be made at that level. Governors and counties and everybody else is calling for a reasonable extension and modernizing the definition of Internet access. Let's do a reasonable extension. Let's do no harm to state and local government, but let's go ahead and extend this thing. And the problem I always have with this debate is it always gets to where it has become, and that is they're against the net. When you don't have the facts, you use fear. Well, I think everybody needs to take a step back and see what's being offered and say, wait a minute, there's a different way forward and a better way forward and a good policy perspective forward. And I think, again, I'm going to go back to the Carper Alexander. We can address a couple of very good points that I think we can actually agree on and move this ball forward. And then we can be back here for this lunch again four years from now.
Hey, free food. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take two more, two wait. more, two more questions, and let me ask this. We we've, we've done just accidentally, obviously, and they were good questions, but we've done three elasticity economic questions in a row. If there are other kind of points out there, I want to illuminate them. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to take two more questions, but I'm not going to give you guys a chance to do closing statements. So that, that's the trade-off. Oh. I know, I know you guys are, and they're going to be real sad not to hear you guys talk more. So. <laughs> All right, questions over here. Okay, um, a question directly to the municipalities. Um, obviously, the other guys get to throw in here, but specifically, given there seems to be some agreement that the internet has been good for everybody, and in fact, I suspect you guys have already been really good for local government and state government, in that light, why would you not be for a permanent moratorium? The flexibility aspect of it is the most important thing. Uh, the, the permanency locks into, even if we have a great definition, uh, the Internet could change. We don't know. The Internet is not, of the four years ago, is not the Internet today. It's a safeguard. It's an opportunity for us to be able to come back and revisit it. It's not saying it wouldn't continue after that, but it's an opportunity to come back and revisit it and see if we're in the same place we are today. David? I'd echo that. Uh, the temporary was an important safeguard and one of those balances. And again, I, I know I keep harping on this, but this is federal power versus, you know, state authority. And you know, going all the way back to the Commerce Clause, just because Congress has the power doesn't mean it should use it necessarily. It should address problems, uh, not, you know, not create solutions for things that aren't necessarily there. It, it, making a bad definition permanent um, will actually make everything worse, both for state and local government, and quite frankly, it could be for the Internet as well. You could create tax differentials between competitors. It could actually be anti-competitive moving forward. We need to make sure we get this right. David, I mean, making it permanent doesn't mean that it could never be amended. If there were these, uh, the fears that you all have could always be addressed. At some point, they could be addressed in a year. Well, you can address them with me next time we have to renew this thing. Yeah, you make a, you know, that, that's an old argument. Oh, we, 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 can, argument. we can amend it. We yeah. all know, we're all, a lot of congressional staffers here, how hard it is to amend a permanent bill. And remember, on, on the Internet Access Moratorium, the only one with oversight over this thing is Congress. Having them come back every four years and take a look and say, let's check and see where we're at, makes a lot of sense, especially when you're talking about limiting the authority of state and local government. Last question right over here. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to put this into a question. Um, so the question is, or let me paraphrase, there are, there are still urgencies in budget shortfalls at the local level. Uh, the, the flexibility to tax the Internet seems like one way they could, the localities could raise revenues. Uh, why does that not make it a good idea? Because localities need revenue. Could I just say that I think that, again, at some points in this discussion, there seemed to be unanimity that nobody wants to actually tax the Internet. Okay. Your question is when state, when localities in particular really face revenue challenges, shouldn't they be able to tax the Internet? I think that what your question really points out is that absent a moratorium, despite all the rhetoric to the contrary, we're going to see taxes on, on, the, on the Internet. That, that exactly driven, you know, we see this up in, in, in many different ways, but there's, there's no question that there are very important things that state and local governments do. And absent the moratorium, we think in many cases there would be taxes very quickly imposed on Internet access or 
discriminatory taxes against businesses that use the internet and for exactly the reason you know that you point out and i know everybody said that they really don't want to do it so since they really don't want to do it we would say make the moratorium permanent so that that is not constantly on the table jeff i'll go to you next just because it's so poignantly to locality well you do you do really get to the point of the difficulty it is at the local level uh, the, there are counties out there that are really hurting and there's no doubt about it uh, but we have limited a access to uh, different types of fees and taxes to be able to provide the services that we require to do. Unfortunately, some are moving to fees for emergency services and others. But it just points out the fact that uh, we're not flush in cash. Uh, we don't want to necessarily tax the Internet. Access, certainly not. Uh, there are other ways of possible goods and services over the Internet that we might be looking to impose sales taxes on. That's another debate. But, but the reality is, is that counties are really hurting out there, and uh, we're, we're not rolling dough. Uh, Roderick, David, either. Just add, adding, I think I think your question really is, who should be making the decisions when it comes to revenues? I mean, at, state and local state and local governments have different priorities. We have 50 different states, uh, all the different counties, the cities. Thank you. The all with unique needs. They have to have a way to make them. Every time that the federal government c comes in and says, "Guess what? You cannot do this." it harms or adjusts their ability to handle exactly the situation. I'm not saying they're going to go out and tax Internet access. I am saying that every time that the federal government decides that it's going to make the decision of how state and local tax dollars are spent, that it hinders the ability of those state and local jurisdictions to make the decisions and, de and provide the services they need to provide. Well, the decision is not about how the revenue will be spent. It's not about the federal government jumping in and deciding whether or not you should spend more money on roads and more money. That's not what this debate's about. It's about whether or not, in the interest of national policy to get broadband deployed ubiquitously, whether or not we should make sure we maintain a, um, a moratorium on taxing just Internet access, just the ability to get online and then to engage in commerce or knowledge. That's really what it comes down to. And I think that debate, that issue has been settled that it should be our national policy. The 12-year advocate in me has been just dying to jump out. I tried to keep myself under control. I, I think I did an all right job. You were, you were under control. But, but I do have one we point. Can, could, can we all agree that if the Internet tax moratorium were to go forward however we think best, the Congress's approval ratings would probably go through the roof? Yes? I think the answer is yes. Depends on how high the ceiling is. <laughs> through the roof? <laughs> That's a high bar. All right. As this you can tell, we had a, a, a very well knowledge, very distinguished, and capable we all like panel. Each Thank other you too. very, very, very much for being here. Thank you all for coming and understanding.